Good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to the latest in uh, the University of Derby student lecture series. Uh, we're very uh, happy to have you all here. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Dr. David Barker. I am the program leader for the MA publishing program here at the university. Uh, but most importantly, I am really excited today to introduce you to our guest speaker, who is Joe Jakeman. Uh, jo is a novelist um, and she has so far uh, written and published two novels. The first was Sticks and Stones, a psychological thriller, uh, which was published by Harvel Secker, an imprint of uh, the UK's largest publishing company, Penguin Random House. Uh, so that came out in 2018 and then in paperback a year later in 2019. And Joe's second book, Safe House, was published in October 2019 in hardcover and then just quite recently, a couple of months ago, in paperback again uh, by Penguin Random House. So Joe is here today to uh, tell us all about the business of writing, what that involves, uh, how one can try to make a living out of writing and all of the various issues uh, involved in that. So I will uh, keep quiet for a minute and I will hand you over to our guest speaker, Joe Jakeman. Hi, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. It's lovely to be here today to talk to you. And um, as as David has said, I'm a, I'm an author of psychological thrillers. And whilst, um, as David says, completely correct, I have got two books published, uh, but I've written many, many more than that <laughs> that haven't been published and also those that are yet to come out with the same publisher. So one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you today was about the business of writing and what I've learned in my time as being able to call myself an author. And uh, it's um, something that doesn't doesn't come easily, I don't think, to people who view writing as, as an art to think of it as a business and everything that entails. So uh, that's what I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about today. And everything I talk about um, this afternoon is based on obviously my own experiences of writing and another author may tell you a completely different story. But I think my journey has been reasonably typical of most authors, I'd say. And I'm, I'm talking as somebody who is four years down the line from having signed a book deal. And the the learning curve has has been steep to say the least and to say I was naive when I started out would be a huge understatement and that's why I think it's great that there are universities like Derby who are who are looking into like amazing um, in publishing and, and getting more information and the very fact that you're here and you're learning about this means that you probably know a lot more than I did when I started four years ago about what goes into the business. I think it is super important for writers to understand that it is a business and I think it's super important that people who are in the business like editors, um, your agents, marketing, proofreaders, all of them, I think it's really important for them to understand that when we writers come into this business we don't have a clue. And um, I'm sure I'm not in the minority when I say that when I sat down to write my first book, I didn't think for one moment about the market. I didn't think about um, all the different stages it would need to go through. I just had an idea. I wanted to write. I loved writing, been writing for years. And I sat down and I wrote a book and I wasn't thinking about editors and um, cover designers or any of that kind of thing at this point. And um, because it has been such a learning curve for me and knowing how little I knew right at the beginning, I have set up a group for writers, for um, writers who are literally just trying to break into the market. And I'm giving them advice on things, really simple things about pitching your book and writing a synopsis. There aren't many places. I mean, recently there are more and more courses, obviously, where you can learn these things and there's resources online, but there is, there is not a lot for writers um, when they're when they're approaching it as this is my art for them to learn how to do this. So the, the group I've set up is is largely about how to break into the industry. And I was having a little bit of a, a moan to them uh, the other week about my when my uh, paperback 
of Safe House came out, I was I was feeling a bit flat. Uh, it was um, Waterstones hadn't taken many copies of my book that Tesco's had. It was a bit of a, a mixed bag. And I was having a moan and um, one of them said to me, if you knew how difficult it was going to be, would you still wanted to have been a writer? And the answer is yes, a thousand times yes, because everything, everything that has been difficult has been far outweighed by the positives. And uh, the title of this lecture today is about business of writing and why it pays to be stubborn. And the reason I, I say that is not just not just to hook you in and think stubborn, what's that about? Um, but stubbornness has served me particularly well. I'm I'm pretty single minded when I make my mind up that I'm going for something. And the publishing industry, not just writing, but anything around it is super competitive. Um, I mean, like I say, we're coming up to four years since I signed my contract and called, but was able to call myself a professional writer. But it's something I've been doing, I've been chasing for, for longer than that. And there are a lot of barriers to becoming a writer, a lot of misconceptions. Um, but I made up my mind that I was going to be a traditionally published writer and it was traditionally published I was I was after and um, it, uh, you know it was coming up to my 40th birthday and um, it was I, I sort of said to my husband give me a year and I'm going to throw everything at becoming a writer and in 12 months time if I've got nowhere I'll get a proper job and so I'd I'd really set myself this is this is my target I've got 12 months to do it and um, you have the barriers of friends and family as well meaning as they are saying um you need to get a proper job you know and um i saw i mean there's a lot of rejection that goes into it as well which is why i think stubbornness is so important and a thick skin at some part at some parts as well um but i saw a post on instagram recently that said wanting to be a writer but not wanting rejection is like wanting to be a boxer without getting hit. And that, I, it made me laugh when I saw it because it's it's part of it. It's true, we don't want rejection and we go out of our way to make sure that our product is such that people won't reject it. Uh, but it it's part of it. You're gonna get rejected because this is a subjective business and some people will like your work and some people won't. And, you know, <laughs> I know we say it a lot, but it's impossible to please everybody. And that's hard to uh, bear in mind when you first start off on this, because if you get a one star review, um, you feel heartbroken. And uh, but the, what helped me was looking at some of my favourite books online and seeing what looking at their one star reviews um, so that when I did get my knockbacks, so I was I was able to say it's just not for that person. It's, it doesn't mean that it's a bad book. And um, I was just casting around my office trying to think, well, you know, what's a, what books have I got in here that I loved? And I just, I just picked up this one as an example. Daisy Jones and the Six, Taylor Jenkins Reid. I don't know how many of you know this one, but um, a couple of years ago, I read this and it was my book of the year. I just found it super fun, really, really enjoyed it. And it, and it gets put on my, my shelf of books that I find quite, sort of inspirational almost because she did something very different with the the way of telling the story because it's all done in interviews so I was really intrigued by that so I looked at her reviews on Amazon she Yay. has over 9,000 reviews an average of 4.4 stars and um and there's 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 reviews such as there isn't a plot this isn't literature it isn't fun and it isn't entertaining I hear people are saying that about one of my favourite books of the year. Um, I mean, so this guy here goes as far and I printed this one off because I thought the cheek. He says they say good artists borrow and great artists steal, which means Taylor Jenkins Reid is a great artist. So he's suggesting she's stolen the idea of her story. Um, <laughs> things like that, you know, it makes me furious on her behalf and I'm sure she doesn't read her reviews and I'm sure she doesn't care at all. Um, but yeah, things like that, I go and have a look and um, 
And I suggest you do the same. Uh, have a look at some of your favourite books and just see that for some people, even when you're talking to your friends about, oh, I've read this book and it's amazing. And they'll say it's rubbish. I hated it. And, you know, we all, it's something I say quite a lot and um, it sounds a little bit cheesy. But when you're writing a book, the one thing you can never account for is the reader and their perspective, where they're coming from. So it will always mean something different to whoever's reading it. And you you can't account for that missing ingredient in the book. And so you shouldn't even try. You just write the book you want to write and, and, and leave the critics to it. You know, that's that's the best thing for it. And I I think one of the reasons it's been easy in inverted commas for me to pursue this and really make up my mind that this is what I was going to do is because I was so clueless at the beginning I um you know, we're sitting here trying to write the best book that we can and that is exactly what you should be doing you shouldn't be worrying too much about the market at that point but I naively thought that I would write my book and my publisher would sell it you know that that's how it would happen I would I just hand it over to them and have nothing more to do with it and the reality is something entirely different and I wasn't aware of how much networking would go into this um, having an eye for um, editing your own work the ability to take feedback which bizarre as it may sound I think is, a, is actually a skill you need to be taught because I know that I've had I had some amazing editors and they you know and they are spot on with their observations but it takes me a minute it really does you know I have to read their feedback and I have to put it to one side and I have to go back to it a week later because my initial reaction is well of course it makes sense did you not read the previous chapter but I have to take my ego out of it and I have to think well, for some reason they missed that point or for some reason it didn't resonate with them so how can I do that um, so there's a lot about <laughs> there's like I said a learning curve and as you go further through the journey of writing you know I've just done the first draft of my fourth book now um, your confidence grows and so you are you know what to push back on with your editor and what not to push back on so for example with safe house the second book that came out my editor who i admire greatly she said that the next door neighbor who was um a grumpy old guy called aubrey she said i think he would be better as a woman because uh, what what was great in your first book was the female relationships so I started changing him to a woman and it just didn't work because it wasn't how I saw him. It wasn't how I saw that relationship playing out. And by this point, I had enough knowledge, enough confidence to go. Well, why wasn't it working for her? And also know that that was I wanted him as a man. I knew exactly what I wanted. So I just I rounded him out. I gave her other female relationships that she could bounce off. And the amount of feedback, the amount of um, uh, reviews and things that I see now saying, and I loved Charlie's relationship with her next door neighbour, Aubrey. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, that's a, that's a great feeling for me. Not that I'm right, she's wrong, but um, more of a, I, I was able to say, well, obviously my editor thinks that that relationship isn't strong enough, but I, I want that in. So how do I improve that? this kind of thing really comes with experience it's very difficult to know that kind of thing when you're starting out in your writing um and you know quite often well i hope i hope that every book i write is improving because of that um you know even even before we get even before you get to the editing stage i had no idea when i was looking for an agent i had no idea how to pitch my book I had no idea about hooks. I was no idea about the industry. So I wasn't thinking about the fact that my agent is looking for a hook to sell into an editor. This kind of thing I don't think comes easily to a writer. And I think that in some cases, publishers are missing a trick or agents are missing a trick by not taking on writers who've got the greatest story idea or the you know they've got a wonderful style of writing but they just don't know how to pitch their book and um 
I hope that good books aren't being missed because the writer just doesn't understand how to put together a submissions package because that's really not what this was about. Um, but for me, it's um, it's not a chore for me to look at all different aspects of the industry now because I'm fascinated by it. I love I love love stories. I love that whole thing about book covers and why they work in different territories and or why they don't work. And um, what's Waterstones friendly? What's supermarket friendly? The titles, the marketing campaigns. I love all of that. So it's it's good for me to be involved in it as much as I possibly can be. But if I wasn't a writer, I wish I I wish I'd known about the industry a little bit earlier because I would have loved to have been an editor. I would have loved to do any of these kind of jobs. I find really fascinating. And I think you have to have an eye on every every area and how it all slots slots together. I think the um, it's difficult to quantify a good book because, like I said, it's subjective. It's it's um, like some books are good to some and, and not to others. And um, and to that end, obviously, I have to hope that I'm aware of what I can control and I'm aware of what has nothing to do with me. And that is something that's coming coming with time and with experience. And um, you know, if I say I'm, I want to be the best writer, there is there's no blueprint for best. You know, what does that actually mean? Is it is it the best characters, the best twist that you would never see coming? Which, by the way, I hate it when um, publishers put on on books because then people read your book looking for that twist. Um, or is it about you know, what? What is it about? What is the best book? And uh, uh, there's um, I think it's widely sort of discussed that. To be an expert or a master in whatever field, uh, you, it takes 10,000 hours of practice. I think it's um, Malcolm Gladwell said that in his book. And um, over here on my wall that you can't see, I've got, um, I was going to grab one off here. I've got um, all kinds of just notes and things that I've written on the wall. And this one says four hours a day, five days a week, 52 weeks a year. It will take me 10 years to hit that 10,000 hours of practice to be a master at my craft. And I know it's not that straightforward just doing your 10,000 hours, but this is my reminder just to get my bum in the seat every day, just to, um, because you, you're only gonna learn by being in it, you're only gonna learn by writing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of nine years into my journey now, so hopefully next year I'm gonna be an expert at this. Um, but you, you know, you never know whether it's whether it's right until it hits the market. I think you have a gut feeling. I have a feeling when it when it's coming together, when you're writing. Um, but it's you don't know what else is coming out at the same time as you that um, you don't know. You just don't know what's going to hit things that uh, even your publishers are saying this is going to be a huge hit. They get it wrong, you know, so if they can't know, then you as a writer can't can't think too much into that because you know, you, you can't control it. And um, your book might do badly because of a bad book cover. You know, not things just not being picked up. Um, I've got a few of um, a few book covers here just to just to show really the difference in the um, safe house. When it came out in hardback, they went with this cover where you can see that, um, you know, it's it's nice. It's got a house on the coast and it says not everyone deserves a second chance but it didn't sell well in hardback and the reviews are great I had some um, really good sort of um, national newspaper reviews uh, I've I've checked my reviews this morning because I was coming on today I got no one star reviews yet uh, and it didn't work so for the paperback they went for something different and they talked to Tesco's who were stocking the book to what was going to be appealing to their market. So it's it's completely, it's just a different sort of feel to the book, this one being dark and brooding, but they felt that this one is one that people would browse the shelves and pick up. And they went with a different tagline. They went with, she lied to protect a killer, now there's nowhere left to hide. Now, I'm not involved in, 
in those, you know, they send me the books, um, the pictures, they'll say, say, what do you think of this? And, and I do give my feedback. I, I, I wanted a couple of things changing just with the lettering on this one. Uh, but mostly I, you know, I, I'm not coming up with these things. They are and they're doing it based on the market and they're doing it based on feedback from Waterstones and Tesco's. Yeah, and the terrible thing is, you know, they came up with this as a, this is the kind of cover somebody's going to pick up when they browse. And now all the shops are shut. <laughs> so, um, you know, what can you do? But um, like I say, it's in Tesco's and it's selling well there. So I'm thankful for the small things that you do have. Uh, but um, yeah, I mentioned obviously uh, looking at my um, reviews this morning and um, looking at the bad reviews. And I, I don't look at my reviews and it's not because I'm precious. It's because I, I think that all writers, and I think actually this goes for whatever um, whatever business you're in, I think you work better when you're confident in your ability. So um, I, I don't see why you would put yourself through having anybody undermine you. Uh, I think we've all got that little voice in our head saying that bit that you've just written is utter trash. So I, 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 I'm not gonna go seeking out um, anything negative, but it did look this morning and it made me laugh actually because um like i said i don't have any one star reviews so that's nice but this two star review made me laugh um i bought this book after seeing an ad what a gem marvelous to read clever plot enfolding gently and logically i loved it two star uh, what do i have to do sally <laughs> i don't you know I, I just can't take myself too seriously i can't take these reviews seriously but um you know I'm, I'm hoping maybe sally just pressed the wrong star button there but likewise if i take sally's i always have to take peter's i've not read it yet but it looks okay five stars yeah so <laughs> none of that is really it's not actually saying anything it um it's not helping me write my next book any better so on the whole i steer clear of anything that is going to bring me down um, and and feed into any kind of insecurities that that I might have. And um, like I say, you know, I, I don't understand the markets as well as my publishers do. And just so whilst we're still on, um, we've just been talking about the book covers and the fact that I don't really get involved that much with the book covers, apart from I say I love it or mm, I'm not sure about that one. What's your what's your thoughts behind it? with my first book sticks and stones um they went for a very uh just like a domestic thriller quite kind of look they wanted it to be sort of classy sort of thing so uh but with like a broken teacup sticks and stones it you know it doesn't really say what what's going on in the book but you kind of get the feeling of a domestic sort of drama and that was sold in america and america went yeah i see i see your domestic drama but we see revenge they not only change the cover, they change the title to The Ex's Revenge and have three women at the top of the cellar steps because in the story they they lock their abusive ex in the cellar. So they went for something completely different. You know, UK went subtle, US went, we don't do subtle. And they went for something completely different. And um, the UK, when it came to the paperback, nicked their idea. They went, yeah, actually, we quite like that image. So the um, the different countries, you know, they do talk to each other. They do see what's working in those countries and what's going on. And and all of them have, you know, French. That's the way the French did it. They're all different countries, all have different different ways of marketing it. And I can't say what, what works for one one country and not another so when they send me my polish cover and they say what do you think i really have no clue and i largely leave it up to them uh, the only real work i've had to do with other countries who are publishing my book is with america and canada because their their editors have um, they edit the books as well so even after my uk editor has done her edits and it goes off to america or Canada and the editors there then have their say on it and there has been a little bit of um, of differences between what the American editor wants and what the UK editor wants and that has been quite 
difficult it feels like I'm choosing between divorced parents or something and I don't want to I don't want to upset either of them and um, so it's it's difficult to tread that line a little bit um, but I, I, I suppose I should talk a little bit about uh, my path to getting here and to becoming a writer and I, I, I suppose like most people it's been a little bit of a challenge I haven't just gone straight into it and um, got here within a, a year or anything you know I think the average age of uh, an author getting their first book published is 36. It, you, know, it, you do hear of people younger than that, but it does tend to be a certain age. I was a little bit later, like I like I mentioned, I was coming up to my 40th birthday and decided I was going to give it everything I got. So um, I um, I haven't I haven't worked in the creative creative industry at all until this. I um, I grew up in a family where my dad was a, a well he was in the army and then he was a policeman and my mum worked for the benefits office there was nothing really artistic going on around me I didn't know any authors I didn't know any artists I had no clue that you could even really do this as a job you know but I was I was an only child I was obsessed with books uh, but it was always kind of a thing for other people for for the longest time you do hear about those authors who say I knew from when I wrote my first short story age six, it was all I, I was going to do. Um, for me, I think it had to be a little bit later because I I wasn't passionate enough about anything until I'd re reached a certain age. Um, I think it wasn't until I had kids that I knew the fear of losing one of them. And, you know, that's part of what fed into my first book about what you wouldn't do to, to um, to protect your child so I you know when I went to university I did a business degree um you know I I wanted to do English at university and my dad said now you'll only become a teacher and I don't want you to become a teacher I don't know what was so evil about being a teacher um I did a business degree and I uh, I had a job before I even graduated I'd already you know got a um, work, working for the lottery Ended up in London working for Price Waterhouse Coopers as an executive search and selection consultant. So based just recruitmency, recruitmency, recruitancy. I can't even speak today. And um, yes, yeah, so I was a recruit recruitment consultant for them for quite some time. And the job was OK. It was you know, it was a job. It paid the bills. And I moved out of London. Me and my husband moved out of London back to Derby because my mum was sick. You know, that was the only reason. I actually started thinking about well, what do I want to do rather than just, you know, looking for the next promotion or what have you. And so, um, so yeah, so we, I came back to look after my mum and I, um, I was really burnt out, actually. And I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, had my children, had my twins. And then when it comes back to looking at working again, I knew I couldn't go into something like recruitment consultancy and I wanted to do something for myself. I wanted to feel proud of something. I wasn't really proud of being a recruitment consultant, as fine a job as it was. And I thought, God, I'd love to write. I'd love to be in control of my own hours, which is a joke. But, you know, I thought I'd be in control of my own hours. I'll do something that satisfies me. And I I started off by writing historical fiction and I sent that to maybe 30 agents, 25, 30 agents, I'd say. And um, yeah, no, no interest. So I had interest from one and she wanted to make so many changes to the character. My main character, she said, was too working class. And and I and I she said to come back once I'd rewritten it and I and I didn't agree with her. So I didn't. <laughs> so and it went nowhere. And um, so, like I say, you know, coming up to 40, I did, um, did a course. So I did a, I've done a couple of local courses in Derby, one at Mackworth Library, one at the university, uh, not the university, sorry, the museum. And uh, then I saw a course with creative, um, what's it called, Curtis Brown Creative. And it was an online six month uh, writing your novel course. So they only took 14 people at a time. I couldn't afford the course, but I applied anyway because I thought I won't be one of those 14. And of course, I got I got chosen to be on it. I had to borrow the money to do it. And I um, 
I looked at it like a business right from the get go. I was thinking of of this like, OK, so how many people get published who do these courses? And because um, that was one of their selling points was how many people they got book deals off this. And I worked out it was it was one point three per people per course. So I thought I, I can't just be in the top half of this class. I have to be the best. So I threw everything into this course. I was I was there giving feedback on everything I was. And I was out of my depth by a long way. Most of the people on this course had done MAs in creative writing. They were talking about books I'd never read and they were quoting them. And I was thinking, well, is this for me? Because I, I think that some people do feel that the industry is, you know, there are barriers to getting into the industry if you don't have a certain background or a certain education. And I, um, I was reduced to tears on occasion because of feedback I was getting on my work, but I was like, nope, I'm learning, I'm learning. I'm also learning whose feedback to take and who's not the person who hates my writing. They're not my target audience anyway. And um, that ran for six months and that finished in the August. And in September, I spotted the York Festival of Writing. Uh, Joanna Cannon, I don't know whether you've heard of her, she wrote The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. She's another Derbyshire author. She'd, um, I'd been following um, her a little bit and I saw her at the Derby Book Festival. And she'd won Friday Night Live at the York Festival of Writing. And I thought, well, I want that. That's what I want to do. because That's how she got her agent. So I applied to their three competitions, which were um, Best Pitch, Best First Chapter and Friday Night Live. And I got shortlisted for two of those, Best Opening Chapter and Friday Night Live. And that's when you um, speak for, it's your first 500 words. You read them out on a stage um, to a room full of your peers, to agents, to editors. And um, it's it's one of the scariest things I've ever done. But, you know, I made up my mind that like, this was this was my opportunity. And unfortunately, which is often the way of things, a week before or 10 days before, I um, started with a bit of tummy ache and next thing I knew was um, emergency surgery in hospital. And one of the first things I said was when I came, came out of um, like recovery, I said, well, I've, I've got to go to York this weekend. I've, I've got a competition. <laughs> and um, they said it would be unwise, unwise of me to go, which I didn't take as a definite no. And so, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, stubbornness has got me to here. So I, um, I took my kids out of school for the day because I had nobody to babysit for them. And my husband took the day off work because I was told I couldn't even lift a kettle or anything. And the whole family, we all got on the train, my husband carrying my bags all the way up to York. And I must have looked like the biggest diva going in there and my husband had to change my shoes for me. I couldn't bend over <laughs> and I wasn't going on stage in, in ugly shoes. I wanted my heels. I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. I can't remember much of it because I was whammed out my head on painkillers. And um, but I won. So I, I, I won this amazing competition, a great opportunity. Four agents came up to me afterwards asking for the full manuscript which I hadn't finished writing, but I said I had and said, yeah, yeah, yeah just, I'm just going to go and polish it a little bit and send that to you. And um, yeah, and that's how I got got my agent. It was through a hell of a lot of um, unwise decisions in some ways, putting myself forward for a course I couldn't um, afford going to a competition that I'd been medically advised not to go for. And I, I might have still got the same results if I'd have waited a year, but I made my mind up that this was the year and this was, you know, I told my husband I was getting a proper job if this didn't all work out. So I kind of had something to prove. And, um, you know, it's, <laughs> there's so many times I could have, I could have dropped out and I do wonder what was going on in my mind at some of those points. But I wouldn't have changed. I wouldn't have changed a thing. And um, and I think that's important because there is there would have been somebody else willing to take my place in that competition. There would have been somebody else taking my place on that course. And there will be no 
shortage of other writers if you're looking to writing or editors or whatever it's a it's a hugely sought after job even though you know pay is dropping but there's never any shortage of writers and um yeah i think i think it's only fair to give the balanced view that it's not all great i mean there are some brilliant things about being a writer and i love it and the thrill of seeing your book in Waterstones for the first time is amazing and uh, the thrill of people reading your book and messaging you to say what it meant to them is just the most amazing feeling and um, for all of that I wouldn't change it but I think it's also fair to to touch on the fact the pay is not great you know the money in this industry for writers the top 10% of the writers are still getting 70% of the money that's 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 out there that they're being paid. You know, so if you're not JK Rowling and Lee Child and all the rest of it, you, there's no yacht. You're not buying a yacht anytime soon. And there are frustrations when uh, when your book doesn't chart. There's frustrations when your when your publisher takes on a shiny new debut um, pays them seven figures for it. There is jealousy, you know, there just is when the when the celebrity author gets a three book deal and you're not even sure they're actually written their own book. There's, you know, there's a lot that um, that bothers me on a day to day business. There is a lot about about the industry that um, that stops diversity. You know, I mean, if I hadn't had a husband who was earning a steady salary, I couldn't have taken that year to try and um, pursue my writing dreams. If I didn't have people I could borrow that money off, I wouldn't have been able to take that Curtis Brown creative course. You know, I'm I'm coming from a reason that it seems strange for me to say from a privileged background because I obviously don't feel I am privileged and I feel I've absolutely had to fight and scrape but I'm still a lot more privileged than many so you know it's it's not always that inclusive and um the the worst thing that's happened to me because of writing uh because of this industry happened about three weeks before my hardback of my first book came out so they my publishers um they let they they released the ebook of sticks and stones three months before the hardback came out because with debuts it's it's a tough sell to get people to buy a hardback of somebody they've never read before so the ebook was there to generate a bit of interest to get some reviews on amazon and about three weeks it was all going well it was all going well i was um finishing the first draft of safe house at this point and three weeks before the hardback came out, uh, my publishers and my agent got a letter from somebody from my past saying that one of the characters in Sticks and Stones was based on them and they were going to sue me for defamation of character unless my publishers pulled the book and I paid them a substantial sum of money. And it, oh, I mean, you can imagine I was I thought my publishers were going to drop me. Um, I was worried about the legal ramifications of this. He'd taken on the Beckham's lawyer. He was, you know, really quite serious, spending a lot of money on this. And um, bearing in mind my first book was about coercive control and domestic abuse. And this person was putting their hand up and saying, oh, this, yeah, this sounds like me. It, it, it brought up a lot of shit, as you can imagine. It was horrendous time. I didn't enjoy my launch because I thought that he was going to turn up at my launch and cause a scene. And do you know what? My publishers, they will forever have my loyalty. They can they can offer me the worst advance for my next book and I'd probably still take it because they had my back. And I am so grateful for all the things I don't even know are going on behind the scenes, like their legal department were on it and they they just they were angry on my behalf. And they said, oh, yeah, we've seen this so many times. This happens all the time. You're not even the only case that's landed on my desk today. And they said he will not get a penny out of us. They were furious. And um, but I still had to go through everything that happened um, in this relationship with them and they were absolutely amazing and it didn't go away for about three months the other lawyer had three months to put in a formal um 
I don't know, like legal challenge, I suppose. And the deadline just came and went and they hadn't put anything in. But um, I guess getting a, a letter from Penguin Random House's legal team would put you off a little bit. They they knew what they were doing. And and also I could say hands on heart, everything this guy had said, well, that's me. I could say, but no, it's not. I got this from this newspaper article or from this, you know, so I, I was on I was on strong ground. I was on steady ground with this. Um, but it was that was yeah, that was the most challenging. I think that people don't realise that you're not JK Rowling just because you've been published. I'm pretty sure he just saw a way to get some money. And um, but it, it it had a knock on effect. And I then found my second book really difficult to write because I was second guessing all the time, scared that somebody would see some of themselves in this, that I shouldn't, you know, all, I shouldn't be talking about personal things that affected other people. And it um, took me a while. It took me a while to build my confidence back up again. And now with book three and book four that I've just finished, um, I'm a lot more confident about my writing and um, a lot a lot happier. And I and I will keep writing about things that are important to me and have a personal um, a personal resonance with me. So you know, the, like the coercive control in that one, um, Oscar Lomas, Who Killed Oscar Lomas, which is the one that will be coming out next year, uh, is about suicide because of a friend of mine who died by suicide. And my fourth one is about bullying because of my son who was being really badly bullied at school and I felt powerless. So I will always write about things that are passionate, that I'm passionate about. And um, I've kind of come to terms with the fact that people won't like it and the people that don't like it are the right people to piss off and I'm okay with that. I have made peace with that. So um yeah, I think um I think it's just I think it's just fair to say that it is a um there are peaks and there are troughs in in this industry and um and with all those knockbacks you really have to have made up your mind to go for it. Be stubborn about it. Don't take no for an answer. Um yeah, I think that's probably that that probably covers all of um, how I got to be here anyway and all the facets. So there's so much more I could go into, but I'm very conscious of the time. So I'm going to uh, hand back to David now and um, and any questions either David or or anybody else has for me. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Joe. Uh, that was absolutely amazing. I've learned a huge amount from that and um, it had some real drama to it as well. Your guest tour. That was that was amazing. Um, so, yeah, I think we have got some questions. Um, my first one, if there's anyone listening who is thinking of becoming a writer or already is a writer to some degree um, and wants to improve their writing, work on their craft, increase their chances of becoming a published author. Um, what advice would you give? Because, I mean, you've talked a lot about, uh, you know, the, the Curtis Brown course that you went on and other things like that. Do you think you can improve as a writer just by yourself? Or do you think it's much more helpful to engage with other kind, any kind of writing community that you can find in your local area or something like that? What do you think? Yeah, um, I obviously, I, as you said, I did the courses, but uh, one of the reasons I run my uh, my own sort of why I've got this writing group at the moment is because because of what I mentioned about uh, these, there are barriers to people uh, getting into this industry. And I think it's wrong that you do have to pay that kind of money to get a leg, to just try and get into a an industry that feels quite closed off. But um, I know that I wouldn't have been able to improve as a writer in complete isolation, but I've got some I've met some amazing people through writing. There are a lot of writing groups out there. Um, I know that we have friends in common, David, you know, Roz Watkins, who's another Derbyshire writer, Roz and a couple of other writers. We we call ourselves the Doomsbury group. We're forever bouncing ideas off each other. We're saying, would you read my first chapter? Um, and that's how you improve. It's it's taking feedback from the right people. You have you have to ask for feedback and, and that's how you're going to improve. But, you know, 
don't ask your mum because she's going to tell you it's brilliant no matter what it is. Um, and I don't necessarily think writers are the best people to ask advice from because I think we're looking at it from a writer's point of view. You just you want to get to readers, to people who read that kind of stuff and just get that honest feedback about how it made them feel, not about your grammar and whether or not you've got a dangling modifier and all the kind of things my editors give me notes about when they, <laughs> when they come back to me. Um, it's all about it's all about practice and it's all about immersing yourself in reading books and just writing, writing, writing. Brilliant, thank you for that. Uh, next question we have here is, uh, I guess, also about the craft of writing. What kind of research do you do? Uh, and how long on average might you spend doing that kind of research before you start writing a novel? Or are you just making it up? Yeah, I'm pretty much, I pretty much make it up. No, um, I, it, it really, really differs. So because I'm writing a lot from a uh, personal experience because I'm doing the the thrillers that I'm writing now not a huge amount of research has to go into them not like when I was writing my historical thrillers and I would have to do reams and reams of research so I tend to do a first draft as quick as I can I will absolutely power through a first draft and just leave big gaps and then I'll know what I need to be researching and then when I've researched it that might actually take me off in a different angle so a different direction so I don't, that's why I don't put a lot into my first draft. I don't, I don't spend any time rereading it or anything. I just get it all completely down. And um, it's now, uh, now, now I've just written my fourth book because I have a little bit more of an understanding about what I'm doing. I am trying to plan more. I'm hoping that will save me some time instead of going now that's not working and, and getting rid of it and I, I'm yet to know whether that's working. I'm just going to angle my screen here but if you can see down my wall these are this is my post-it notes for book three. This my my pink line is the um, the main story arc and my the blue is the subplots so I've actually got that on there just to show and that's after I've already written it I've then gone on and plot, uh, put on where the rise and fall is to check that it is going in in the way that I wanted it to. And it has helped me pick out a couple of things with that I'm like, well, no, that, that's bringing the story down when I'm hoping for a lift here. So it has helped me in moving things around. So that's, that's I, I kind of plan after the effect. I do my first draft and then I do my research and my planning. Brilliant answer, thank you. Um, it's fascinating. I've heard that from so many writers that, uh, and I think maybe this is a difference between people who become writers and people who maybe like me <laughs> just sort of dream about it. Uh, you actually get you, you, that focus on getting that first draft done uh, mm -hmm. seems to come up a lot, and it's like you just write the thing, and then you then you can start playing around with it and improving it. Uh, we have a question from Anna. Hello, Anna. Can you tell us more about where you take your inspiration from? And how, and how that goes from a basic idea to a bit more of a fleshed out idea and then the actual manuscript. So where, yeah, where do the ideas come from? Yeah, so with, um, if you take the first one, Sticks and Stones, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was kind of a funny thing. I was doing the course, I, I had an idea. My, my first chapter comes quite quickly. I, um, my first chapter rarely changes from first draft right through to the end because that's the one that's setting the tone for me. So I, uh, my, my first chapter of Six and Stones, well, I just wrote the three women at a funeral of a guy and they weren't sad he was dead. And they were all sitting in different parts of the church. They knew each other was there and they, they knew something about why this guy was dead. And I didn't know when I started writing it what that was. So I had that as my first thing. And, and I mainly come from, so I'd been at somebody's funeral quite recently and I was kind of looking around at all the who could be in which funeral cars and who couldn't and uh, just all that drama that comes with it. So it started off from there and I was going through a bit of a reading classics phase and I'd, I'd just been reading Jane Eyre. And I was a little bit annoyed at Mr Rochester locking his wife in the attic and not saying anything to Jane about it. And I just had this, well, what if the tables were turned and instead of Rochester locking his wife in the attic, the wives locked Rochester in the cellar. And the character in my book is called Philip Rochester as a as a nod to that. 
So I wanted to turn that on its head a little bit. And it had when I first started writing that one, it hadn't long happened that coercive control had uh, become against the law. So a lot of that was in the in in the news at the time. So I took a lot of newspaper articles. I um and I would just talk to people because people are quite interested in what you do as a writer. So I'd be on the side of a sports pitch whilst my kids are playing whatever sport. And I remember talking to somebody and I said, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this uh, this story about um, this abusive ex. And, and this woman turns to me and went, let me tell you about my ex. <laughs> you know, the stories people tell you. And I'm like, well, that's going in the book. <laughs> so a lot of it comes from just discussions. It, it, it just grows and grows and grows. But it starts with just an initial idea and a well, what happened there. Excellent, thank you. Um, another question, um, and you sort of maybe touched on this, but you know, I think everyone or a lot of people are very aware that making uh, a lot of money or even a sort of normal living as a writer of books is challenging. Yeah. Um, is do you think the rise of some of things like Netflix and Amazon Prime, and there seems to be more and more film and TV content based on books and I've even seen a couple of articles recently about novelists sort of wanting to get into that area or being asked to come into that area do you think that might be a way that sort of being a writer goes a bit more towards the sort of tv film model or I don't know just your thoughts on that really yeah I mean I um my none of my books have been optioned for television I wish they would be <laughs> it's a bit of a dream of mine to get one of them on television but um, at my agency, I have a film and TV agent, which makes me sound proper poncy. But um, so Leah at the agency is talking to scouts about the kind of thing that they want to see on television. From what I hear, I've got uh, several writer friends that do get optioned and um, <laughs> very rare that it gets anywhere. It's very difficult to get past, you know, to get to get the project greenlit. Um, but I, I also, I, yeah, I do think it's you write your book and you hope to get paid for it. You don't think you think at that time, well, it will get picked up in America or it might get picked up by Netflix. But all of that is people refer to it as free money, which I don't like because I've worked blooming hard for this free money. But, you know, I've the same amount of work went into that one book as as getting out in America and it being optioned for anywhere. So, yes, the more channels that that one that one book, that one project can get into, then absolutely. Um, it's certainly an area I'm looking into because I just I just love screenplays and that kind of writing anyway. So and I think it would help my writing. And I I figure if I write a book in, um, in more of a five act structure rather than a three act structure, my first books were three act. I'm now doing a five act structure, which is more of a, um, a TV kind of thing is more five act then I'm hoping Mr Netflix might pick it up and go, I can see how I would easily adapt this for television. You know, it's win-win. There's nothing to lose there, is there? Brilliant, thank you. Um, I love that idea of there being a Mr or Mrs Netflix. Uh, that should be a that should be a thing, shouldn't it? Right, um, we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, I've got, you, you sort of mentioned something earlier about writers getting uh maybe annoyed when like celebrities come in and say oh well, i'm gonna write a book yeah um is that true of all celebrity books or are there some examples like i don't know like someone like richard osman where it's actually like okay he's written he's quite a decent book there i mean are there varying degrees of that kind of thing yes <laughs> yes yes and like you say richard osman um he worked hard. He actually was at a lot of the crime writing festivals before his, come, his book came out. So um, I was sort of aware of him at Harrogate Crime Festival and things like that. So he, yeah, he's really, he's worked for that. It hasn't hurt him one bit that he already has a platform. You know, simples. Um, but I don't begrudge him for a second. And um, I mean, this is just between us, obviously. But I did an event um Probably when Sticks first came out, it was a libraries event. We went to talk to try and get libraries to stock our books, you know, because that's another, you know, every time somebody takes my book out of the library, I get 9p. And um, I was sharing the bill with Anton de Beck, you know, from Strictly Come Dancing fame. 
And when he was, people were asking him about his writing journey and I thought, you haven't a clue. <laughs> so I got the impression and I could be wrong, but he said, well, the, re the way I get my ideas for books is I sit down with my editor and we sketch out some ideas. And I thought, hold on, I didn't even get to an ed editor until I was on about draft five and I'd got myself an agent. And so it is different. And um, but, you know, he has a fan base and I was on I was on stage directly after him and he'd been all like getting people up in the audience and doing dance moves. And then as I went on stage, he leant over and whispered to me, good luck following that. <laughs> <laughs> he was lovely actually he was hilarious they all absolutely blooming loved him um but I know that he doesn't have he he hasn't sat in a room on his own for a year and written that it's a very much collaborative thing for him whereas with Richard Osman I think he really has come up with the idea and and yeah and worked on it brilliant thank you Joe um I think that is basically all we have time for today. Um, so it just remains for me to uh, say an enormous thank you to Joe Jakeman for uh, genuinely fascinating, interesting, entertaining, knowledgeable and wise guest talk. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, thank you for bearing with us through all of our questions at the end as well. Um, yeah, so thank you everybody for uh, listening, for joining in, um, and I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you found that as interesting as I did. All right, thank you so much, Joe, and bye-bye, everyone.